Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New Millennium Podcast. My name is Abby Volkovich. I'm your host, and I'm representing the TEDx IDC Herzliya team. Haven't heard of us yet? TEDx IDC Herzliya has lately been called to spread insights and ideas about the new millennium. See, in the past 20 years, the global playing field has completely changed, driven almost entirely by humans. These changes have altered history at a rapid pace. The New Millennium Podcast gives us an opportunity to highlight the transformative ideas and contributions that are shaping the new reality, as seen through the eyes of a number of incredible individuals. Our team has arranged an incredible lineup of speakers for the podcast. That being said, I'd like to introduce today's guest on the show. Our guest today is Ori Israeli. Ori brings over 20 years of venture investing and corporate development experience. He served as Director of Investments for Motorola Solutions, heading corporate investment activities in Israel and Europe, and was a Managing Director with Giza Venture Capital in Israel and the US. Ori will elaborate a little bit more on his background, and he will give us some tips and tricks for upcoming startups, and also which industries to look out for in the future. Without further ado, I give you Ori. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the New Millennium Podcast. I'm happy to be joined today with Ori Israeli. How are you doing, Ori? Great. Thank you, Abby. It's great to have you here, and we're very happy that you're partnering us for the TEDx event. Uh, so, Ori, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, Magenta, which is the, the your 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 company. So, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Abby. And thanks for uh, having me here. This is a very special occasion for me. Thank you. So, uh, you know, just to give you some background on myself, you know, I uh, actually, I'm, I'm a VC today, of course, but uh, I actually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Moshavnik by birth. You know, I came from a Moshav, I grew up in a Moshav, I came back to the Moshav, and I was always passionate about uh, technology. And uh, since I was a kid, I was constantly looking at, uh, you know, an innovation and uh, uh, how things work. Uh, and actually, after my uh, military service, uh, I, I was in the Air Force, mostly in technical uh, duties in nature. I sort of wanted to expand my horizon, so I went to study economics in Tel Aviv University. Uh, and, you know, economics is not a profession. It's not like computer sciences or engineering. It's, uh, it's more of a way of thinking and approach, uh, you know, how to be efficient and understanding sort of um, how to describe economic phenomena and social behavior. And so with this type of, uh, of, of education and background and my passion for technology, uh, and after working for a couple of years uh, in an agri-tech company, uh, I was looking for a way to combine these together, and uh, and I was fortunate, uh, you know, two years actually before the uh, dot com bubble burst, to join a fund called uh, Giza Venture Capital, which was one of the earliest venture funds in Israel. And uh, I guess I learned venture capital from the uh, ground up, and I had very good mentors and teachers with uh, sort of on the ground training, and I was with uh, Giza Venture Capital for about uh, thirteen years. You know, it's a long time. And uh, I invested in many great companies in various fields. Um, but, you know, uh, y- you know, they call the VC side the dark side. And after so many years in venture, I felt I was missing two other sides of this ecosystem, you know, the startup side and also the large corporate side. So uh, really to be a better VC investor and to be able to uh, help the portfolio companies even further. So after uh, taking some nice time off, I rolled up my sleeves and uh, started working with uh, uh, startups uh, in and with actually. And uh, that and I did that for about another four years. And that really taught me um, and exposed me to things that you don't really see from the uh, VC side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, as uh, as I was working with startups, I actually uh, received an offer from uh, Motorola Solutions VC, and uh, that was uh, actually very difficult to refuse. And it also allowed me to put the third piece of the ecosystem together, 
sort of the large corporate experience. Right. Uh, so I joined uh, MSVC and uh, I was uh, heading their uh, investments in Israel and Europe. And it was really a great time. I had uh, two great bosses, the Motorola CTO and the head of ventures. Uh, and at uh, MSVC, we also focused on strategic fit uh, for these uh, startup companies we invested in and also the use cases. And this is a bit different viewpoint from being a financial investor uh, in that it's not just about the exit. You actually have to think about where that fits. Mm -hmm. uh, so the experience taught me a lot about how corporate uh, corporates work and, and how they think, of course, but also what is important for a, a multinational company, an NMC, to basically develop a meaningful relationship with the startup, as well as what would be sort of considered, um, I guess, the strategic fit for an NMC uh, or an MNC, actually, uh, as an acquisition, a multinational company. Um, so when Mitsui actually presented the opportunity to form a fund with them, uh, you know, though I enjoyed myself at Motorola, I knew it was the right timing and opportunity to actually leverage my combined VC startup and, and corporate experience and work with them, uh, of course, and with uh, Ron Levitsky, who came out of Viola Ventures and has uh, both a startup and, and development experience for Microsoft and Amdocs. And, and by the way, he's an IDC alumni. Um, to establish the uh, fund establishment, Genta. Um, I'm not sure how much you know about Mitsui, but Mitsui is one of the oldest and largest trading and investment companies in Japan. It's uh, over 400 years old. And, uh, you know, they continue to exist and flourish because they are always forward looking, innovating, um, uh, and initiating new businesses. So, you see, the I think they, you know, with Mitsui, Ron, and I, we actually share the same thinking of, you know, yes, first being focused on on fund returns, but obviously, uh, you know, we are uh, looking at um, establishing an already established very good relationships with our investors who are strategic in uh, nature. And uh, we brought in Japanese strategic investors. All our investors at Magenta are Japanese companies. I see. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, sort of uh, yeah, I the, love the that background. Brief, I love that background. It's a really detailed and um, amazing story of how you got to it. Um, what would you say differentiates uh, Magenta from other VCs? Uh, you mentioned briefly how you actually you know, develop that relationship? Is there any other uh, aspects that you would say differentiate you guys? Right, sure, of course. Obviously, you know, it's, a, it's an important question and we often ask ourselves this question again and again, almost every day. Um, you know, we all say we do deep tech and we're active investors and we help our portfolio companies and we invest, you know, and share our network. But I think there are two main things that differentiate us from, um, uh, from other funds and other investors, and they relate to who we are and where we come from. Uh, remember, we are, you know, seeking capital returns first and foremost, um, and we are a partnership with Mitsui, and we are backed by other Japanese strategic investors as well. So um, we're a group of four partners, and we come from different backgrounds and a combination of various experiences. If you, you know, um, we're, we're a team of um, two Israelis and two Japanese. And up until this last August, we were all in Israel. And right now, one of them uh, is back in Japan and because we need this assistance uh, in, in that market. But uh, generally, you know, the people are here and we're on the ground. And the four partners are the ones making the decision now. Uh, just to give you a, a sense of the people, you know, my partner, Dave Takeuchi, has been with Mitsui for many years in technology operations, uh, business development positions, and, and spent several years also investing in the Silicon Valley. Uh, my partner, Ron Levitsky, was with Viola Ventures, as I mentioned before, and, and Microsoft and Amdocs, and starting from technical development, going to product and all the way through strategy, uh, you know, in, in small and large companies. And my partner, uh, Atsushi Mizuno, uh, who is now in Japan, that's the 
partner I mentioned, uh, lived and worked in Israel for over six years. And so probably the longest time an expat has lived in Israel. Uh, and he's been investing, you know, um, and on the investment side with Mitsui Global Investments for over a decade. And that's after he worked with uh, SoftBank. So uh, this combination actually allows us to understand the startups, the innovation world, and what it actually means for strategic players as well. So, you know, and, and this, I think leads me to think and, and, and probably talk about how we, we work with startups we meet because, um, you know, we work with our strategic investors and obviously with the portfolio, but first we have an excellent, uh, we have excellent deal flow, which also means we need to be selective. And, um, you know, we have many examples where we decide not to invest, but we still connect these startups with our network. And this is a policy. Uh, from our experience, this actually translates into benefits for the startups and for the potential customer or partner in our uh, network. And it works for our benefit too, because the, the startups, uh, first of all, do appreciate it and not a lot of VCs do it. And it also helps the community and we enjoy the market validation from our extended uh, community. So it really helps us. It, it takes, you know, there's a price we pay for it, of course, time, and, and uh, but it really does help. And, uh, and once we do invest, we are very active. As I said, everybody says we're active, but we're very active because, you know, our investors have tens of offices around the world. These are very large companies. And so, you know, anything between, uh, anywhere between Japan to the US and, and anything in between, they have offices there and they're uh, helping us to be exposed to the markets beyond our, our networks. Um, so I also think that we are, you know, unique in that regard. And unmost, unlike most VCs, I think the relationship with the investors is a bit different because we do not just report quarterly, uh, yeah. you know, or meet them annually. We have continuous dialogues with multiple people in the organizations, bottom up, top down, uh, and also formal monthly discussions to share ideas and follow up on the actions from previous discussions. So we've even uh, invited some of our investors to send a person to work with us here in Israel. So Japanese people wow. coming to work with us in Israel. And we actually have two people uh, from two different um, investors working with, with us here in Israel. They not just get exposed to the you know, things we're doing, but they really help us because they come from, you know, from companies mm -hmm. that are in the areas where we invest. We also invest in areas that are not necessarily related to our investors, uh, you know, and, but uh, I believe our investors basically cover almost all the areas that Israel have to, has to offer. Uh, so that's not, you know, a typical VC. And I mm -hmm. think uh, we're very fortunate to be able to assemble such investors uh, that we've developed such a close relationship. Yeah, it it and, sounds and like you have a with. more tight knit connection uh, within in general in the company. And that's wonderful. Um, yeah. So because you are very involved in the startup world, what uh, what's the greatest challenges and maybe even tips that you would give startups nowadays uh, as a VC? Right, right. I think, um, you know, well, the, the, the nature of the beast is that startups will always have challenges, right? I mean, that's a given. If you're, if, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, it's because you're looking for the challenge. So I think, uh, you know, it, it's also rewarding if, if there are challenges. If there are no challenges, probably somebody else will do it and it'll be easy. You know, my, uh, my former boss in Motorola used to say, you know, that's, uh, if it's not a challenge, you, d you don't need to get paid for it. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, and, and just like anything else, it really depends on the specifics. So there are current challenges, you know, there's the COVID that's further, uh, that takes a further toll on, on startup companies. And uh, think about st seed stage companies, right? They're just uh, starting and they need to build a team and founding group. 
Um, and uh, it's pretty difficult because, uh, you know, there are limitations, also social distancing and closure limitations, and especially here, you know, in, in Israel now. Um, and there's all the way up to raising uh, the pre-seed capital uh, from private angels and, and, you know, private investors and angel investors. And so that's pretty difficult to do when you cannot meet someone uh, really in person, especially mm -hmm. in the early stage. Later stages, you have already things you've proven. But at the early stage, it's it's personal. You know, it's all about the team. Right. Uh, but by the way, once you do establish a startup, especially during crisis times, um, you know, it, it's uh, crises are are often the best times to start a startup because it's there's less pressure on the short term results, uh, and there are you know new opportunities in the market. Uh, you know, because new needs come up and there's vacuum. So startups have an edge because they're fast, they're agile, and, and they can uh, adapt quickly. Uh, now, for more mature startups, I think go-to-market strategies and, and deployment methods have to change because they become challenges, especially given COVID. Uh, you have to look for, uh, it's not just about innovative technologies and solutions, it's about innovative ways to get to the market. It becomes a go-to-market challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And that creates another layer of challenge. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, there are many examples of companies, how they actually solve this with better deployment or, or remote deployment and, and stuff like this. But it's always going to be an issue, I think, for companies who have a hardware component. If you're a software company, it might be easier. Uh, but for hardware and specifically, we don't do healthcare investments, but healthcare medical devices companies, they've been finding it, uh, you know, more difficult um, because of the, you know, right. of, of the distance. Yeah, no, and the regulations in each country is different. So that also has a big factor. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's a, a challenge. Um you know, but uh, I also believe that, um, uh, you know, you uh, you really have to be, um, you, you know, you have to know a lot about what you want to do to overcome challenges. And that's something that uh, sometimes entrepreneurs need uh, help with. So if you ask me, you know, what would be my you, know, you ask my tip for for startups. I mean, it's probably endless, but because <laughs> it's a being a startup, being an entrepreneur is difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think the the first thing you would want to do is get the the right team. You know, it, I'm talking about early stage, seed stage startups. Uh, you need to um, uh, to be able to uh, find the right partner, find the right team to work with. It's a long-term process. Um, it, it's hard to found a, a startup. Uh, it's like being a pioneer, you know, no yeah. matter, you know, if you're successful, if you succeed or you fail, it's going to be a long path anyway. So mm -hmm. you first have to find the right partner to begin the journey with. Uh, someone you would get along with, uh, not only in the good times, but mostly in the challenging times and someone you can trust. Um, obviously, it's a cliche, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use it since uh, I believe uh, in it. And it is mostly about the people that uh, you surround yourself with. Uh, see that they're smarter than you or more experienced than you. And when you, you know, when you hire people, it doesn't matter if it's early stage or late stage. Startups don't have money to educate people. You know, corporates have money to educate people. Startups need people who have the experience, who have done it before. You don't have to be a founder that's done it before, but you need to be. You need to come with experience. You need to be, and you need to be independent. And you need to know that you're hiring someone who will roll up his sleeves because there are no places for you know just management. So you're saying don't save on that specific detail because then it, yes, in the long term, it would it would hurt you. Yes, it would hurt you and you'd find yourself uh, replacing that person eventually. So, um, you know, these are, are, are tough mistakes. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and if I can yeah. add a, a follow up to that, uh, what are the type of questions that you ask a startup that approaches you for investing? Well, you know, it, it's not always just the, the questions. It's how I see the founders, for instance, getting along. Mm-hmm. It's uh, how I see they present their idea. It's to make sure that when they present the idea, it's clear, it's simple. You know, I don't have to be a, a genius to understand what they're saying. But I do expect them to know more than I do. If I know more than they do, I there's no reason for me to invest in what they're doing, right? They have to own the domain. Um, and what I actually like about startups is when they come with a multidisciplinary approach because, you know, no one has monopoly over wisdom. Uh, and so when you have this type of uh, disciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, you actually get a lot of this type of wisdom uh, and that creates the innovation. And so that's important. And, you know, so obviously we go into the, uh, the problem, the pain in the market, who's uh, doing it now, what are the alternatives, you know, competitive landscape and situation. And, but I think eventually it really depends on the stage because we invest from seed stage to B rounds. In the seed stage, it's mostly about the, the team and the market and their ability to deliver. Uh, in later stages, it's mostly about the uh, customers and seeing that the customers are, uh, you know, are, are biting, let's say. So it really depends. Right. But I, right. I, I think, you know, if I had to, to sum it up and say, right, what are the questions, what is the, the question? It's, it's a mix of signals that you get from the uh, entrepreneurs when you ask several questions. Got it. Yeah, that they're solid on on their idea, I guess. That's... Yeah, of course. As you said, it's they need to be solid in the idea. They need to know how to approach the market. Uh, right. They need to have the domain expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, they yeah, need they... to show that they've learned from other people's mistakes. If they have a mentor who is helping them, I think it's a plus. I don't see it as a as a minus. You know, I see it as an op- openness. Um, they need to uh, understand that uh, zigzagging is inherent to, uh, uh, you know, to and as a part of a young uh, entrepreneur's life and right. startup life. Yeah, it's uh, wonderful. And, so, and they need to be flexible. Yeah, I, I completely. I mean, it's it's. I'm right now myself studying a uh, business entrepreneurship. So these are uh, huh. wisdom and uh, bits of gold that you're giving me off here. Um, so if we now jump back, you now we spoke about startups more. Uh, if we jump back to the VC world, who should pursue becoming a VC? What is the type of personality that should be doing this? Well, I think um, a VC, you know, if, if you're uh, coming in early and you're early, you know, as an analyst or an associate, it's really uh, what you learn is almost on the job training and, on, uh, you know, that's what you'll get almost like a, an apprentice, be an apprentice, be a good one, you know, do the work, be it's, it's, you know, it could be long hours. It could be uh, with various industries. So you have to be very open to learning uh, quite a lot in a short time because we're not experts in every single domain that we look at. Uh, so you have to be very flexible and, uh, I think eventually you need to develop sort of, uh, uh, some HR skills to understand, you know, if these are the right people, uh, because it, it starts with the people. So I, I believe, you know, that, that's sort of when you come in at that stage, but obviously there are many people coming into this industry uh, after they've been, uh, you know, at uh, corporates, uh, big corporates, technology positions, managerial, operational positions. And that's also very important because 
you want to come with the uh, background of someone who's uh, who's seen it, who's been through it. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were an entrepreneur, of course, and successful one, that would be great. Uh, um, even if not, but it you need to have the experience so that you could see the the other side, right? Just like any other place, if you come to a VC fund and you want to be a successful VC, um, you know, know the challenges. And don't be afraid to invest. Sometimes people come from a certain domain. They, they're afraid to invest in their own domain. Uh, it's easier to invest sometimes in someone, you know, in another domain that you don't actually know because right, you're afraid of some of the things is you bliss. already know. Yeah. Yes. yes. But I think, uh, you know, for young guys coming into this industry, uh, there aren't too many openings. But when there are, I believe, you know, it's about... Um, it's about how you treat knowledge, how you effectively embrace it, how you analyze it. Sometimes it's a very cold type of analysis, and sometimes it actually involves also, you know, in, a, in, in most cases, actually, it does involve how you perceive the, uh, the teams that you meet with. Right. And, and by the way, I must say, this is a, being a VC is a great job because at least, you know, when, as I see it, it involves, um, you know, my personal passion for technology, but it also involves meeting great people all the time. I mean, uh, um, it's like, you know, you get this um, uh, one meeting after the other with people who are innovative, creative, very smart. They're very driven and passionate. Um, it's the, you know, nothing is ever boring. And it's really meeting great people that, by the way, become uh, your friends, because especially given the way that we approach it, uh, we try to help them even if we don't invest. So, uh, you know, eventually we become friends and I have, uh, you know, many, many good friends coming out of this uh, type of a, of a job, which, you know, it's not just a one position where you meet just the people around you. It's it's circles and circles and right. around yeah, you're creating these social energies that are just people right. will exactly. naturally approach you if they're driven and excited and i think that's a very interesting analysis of that that's really cool uh definitely yeah. Yeah. something yeah. that is lit in my head like that sounds very very interesting <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and, cool. and it keeps you and I, I think all in all it, it also keeps you on your toes you know mm -hmm. you have to be alert you have to it's a it's a um, very rewarding actually right. even uh, without the uh, economics around it <laughs> right no maybe if you could uh, potentially share uh, some success stories of startups that you guys have sure. invested in of course so i well i guess uh, you know we're um uh we're a young fund right we uh we're comprised of four experienced general partners and uh, uh, we each have our own success stories. But Magenta is Magenta is actually a, you know, a two year old mm -hmm. uh, young fund. Uh, so we still don't have exits, but we, we have very good companies. And just to uh, you know, give you an example, I think uh, just as an example of a success story that uh, would, would be that, uh, you know, in the first year of uh, our operations, and it, it goes also side by side and with our approach, um, in our first year of operations, we actually had already co-invested with one of our LPs, one of our investors, in a portfolio company called um, Brightwave Vision. I can share it because it's, it's publicly available. And we invested there with them uh, $25 million. And... This is a success story because the that specific LP, by the way, is one of the world's uh, largest automotive headlamp and tail lamp manufacturer for uh, uh, you know for vehicles. And uh, given the trend in, of uh, autonomous vehicles, you know it's obvious why they would want to invest in uh, such an innovative company that develops uh, this unique vision system. And it's, it's basically a sensor for all weather conditions. It, and, you know, fog, rain, snow, and also nighttime for vehicles. So, uh, you know, it it's a great success story in the manner that this is a sort of a built-in relationship 
that can be very good, not just for uh, our LP, of course, but also for the company that we invested in. And we've seen uh, very good, um, I'd say, uh, business results for that company because of this. Mm-hmm. And we're working also on some other investments uh, like this. I, sorry, I cannot share yet, but uh, hopefully, sure. you know, in the yeah, next we'll, couple we'll, of we'll months, have to we'll stay tuned. Able- the listeners will have yes, to stay I tuned guess. and uh, and see what what comes out of these things. Uh, wonderful. Um, so, if you could uh, maybe tell us right now uh, a little sneak peek of knowledge, uh, where you see uh, some industries that are skyrocketing skyrocketing right now uh, for the next ten years uh, that we should maybe keep an eye out for. Okay, sure, of course. So, you know, first, I I think obviously COVID related companies will definitely skyrocket, you know, COVID has uh, and will continue to to change uh, society's behavior. Um, I think working from home, um, you know, is changing how people behave and how technologies are coming into uh, the life cycle and and the life cycle is, is really shortening. To you know, from uh, uh, from ideation to uh, to product, um, I think you know one thing we will see is technologies around uh, mobility will uh, will be strong and, and skyrocket because people um, they just don't want to travel together. <laughs> so you know you want to be in a position where uh, a personal you you want your own personal vehicle to drive you around. Uh, I'm, I'm envisioning right now uh, the Jets, the the Jetsons bubbles that are flying around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and you know, eventually they'll be automated. But right now, uh, we're the driver in most cases. And uh, I'm I'm pretty sure we'll see uh, you know definitely more digital transformation that's accelerating. Uh, mm-hmm. Companies that will be supporting this trend. Will be uh, very busy. Uh, I know of a few that are already, but I think it's going to uh, create another wave. Uh, AI is going to obviously be a, a very large part of it, and AI-assisted v- vertical solutions, I'd say, uh, will also grow uh, rapidly. Uh, one of the things, and one of the reasons, is also because um, I think there are better uh opportunities as uh, compute and specifically edge compute becomes more affordable so ai will not just be on the servers it's going to go all the way to the edge and be ubiquitous on the edge uh i think uh, you know quantum obviously is a great buzz we like to uh, throw it around sometimes uh we're still looking for you know what is the actual application and how you can work with it. Uh, but I think in the next decade, uh, it's going to be solved. I mean, why is going to be solved and for what is going to be solved in that regard? And, and I think, uh, you know, we're also seeing uh, things that are driven by, uh, you'd be surprised by uh, satellites, because satellites are becoming cheaper. And the data that they produce is becoming uh, more cheaper to utilize. And that's why we'll see companies around that area uh, basically analyzing satellite data. It could be imagery, it could be many other things, um, because that data will become affordable and, and usable. Um, and so I'm, I think we'll see clusters of companies around that. Uh, you know, there's an Israeli company actually that does chipsets for. Uh, for space. Uh, so I think uh, that type of uh, trend will continue. Um, and I think, you know, cybersecurity, obviously, <laughs> with all that's good going around, not just our the things that we know, but with everything that's going around and the, the enterprise that's extending up to, you know, your personal computer at home, mm-hmm. you'll have to protect it. Right. And so cybersecurity is going to be uh, very strong in the next uh, uh, you know, decade at least. Wonderful. Yeah, you've given us a, 
a broad sneak peek of uh, your thoughts. And I, I think it's, it's just exciting to hear um, what the possibilities that we could come to with uh, the techno technological advancements. I think a lot of people also say that we can't even fathom the technology that we'll have in, in 10 years, uh, which is in one way scary and also very exciting. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I want to conclude maybe if, if you have any final thoughts uh, for the generation of the new millennium uh, to be part of these uh, endeavors, these changes that we just uh, went over. Uh, any advice, final words that you can maybe give them? Right, right. I think, um, you know, I, I think the millennials will actually, first of all, see and, and need to recognize that uh, they are a different generation on one hand, but COVID specifically opened up an opportunity for the older generation to catch up a bit. Not as much as, you know, not as a millennial, of course, but there's some type of uh, catch up in the digital and literacy of the, uh, the older generation. I think that can create opportunities for them because the, uh, these generations are, are partners or customers are, um, and, and, and if they're closer, they can understand them better. And I think it's a great opportunity. If you're starting today a startup, look at what that has done, right? I mean, look at the, uh, and, and it's COVID driven, right? But it's here to stay. So look at what that has done. Be open to, um, to these new trends. Try to figure out, you know, no one's a prophet, uh, a prophet but um, try to really understand what are the uh, issues that are going to be in the next uh, five years. You don't have to look 10 years ahead because by the time you reach the five years, things will also change for the 10. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think it's very important to be uh, open-minded, flexible, uh, but at the same time, be... Uh, be, be very clear with yourself. I know it's a, it might sound general, but we, you know, general advice, but sometimes we, we lose uh, touch with these types of things because we're on our path and we, uh, you know, we especially given millennials are, are uh, on their path uh, very, uh, you know, they, they want to take large steps and very fast steps. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's good to, to stop, think about what you're doing, think if it's the right place to be, um, and then carry on, even if it is in the right place, of course. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, I think those are amazing yeah. uh, words of advice, and I'll definitely take them myself to heart. Um, and yeah, so I, I want to really give you a huge thank you. Um, to you and Ren and all your partners for first of all taking part uh, with a TEDx uh, and for being on the on the podcast and sharing your your story. I've really enjoyed uh, our conversation and I'm sure the listeners have as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, Artie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Abby. It's been a pleasure, and I, I hope uh, you know we'll see you uh, uh, soon in person. So that uh, you know, we can actually meet. I think uh, this is a special time, and I actually enjoyed this uh, podcast uh, very much. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Take care. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to the New Millennium Podcast. We're very happy that we're able to bring such amazing speakers for you guys to listen to. I'd like to give a big thank you to all the TEDx IDC Herzliya team for making the event happen and helping with the production of this podcast. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode.